because algae actually produces certain types of algae produce this oil that's mm-hmm. that's very usable and uh and if you've ever had a problem with your pool or jacuzzi, you know how fast algae can do its thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's very prolific. I know what Patty's talking about. Yes. <laughs> her uh, jacuzzi that's right there under the deck. You mean the frog pond? The frog pond, yes. Um, it's the, a science experiment of yes. your own. Perhaps you should pour some green tea in there, according to this new study that came out uh, from UC Davis, the Bioenergy Research Center there. If there was going... Other than the wine portion of UC Davis, if there was any department, I'd want to like spend a couple of days learning more. This and, would be it. Yeah, the Bioenergy <laughs> Research Center. And we are now uh, speaking with Dr. Annalise Franz. Annalise, I'm sorry, Annalise Franz, who uh, joins us on the VIP line this morning. Hello, doctor. Hello, Randall. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, we're very excited to have you on. As you probably just heard, um, I think this is just like, your study is so awesome that uh, we've maybe found a channel to make this uh, this use of algae producing. Well, how would you say that? Uh, oil producing algae. There you go. Um, <laughs> maybe ramp it up a little bit. And what uh, made you and your team consider uh, using green tea? And it, and it's not the caffeine in the green tea, right? That that causes this reaction. No, it's a, it's a family of molecules called catechins, and this specific molecule is one that we find in green tea as well as occasionally in chocolate and other places, mm-hmm. but it's known to have some biological effects. So our studies had focused on increasing the amount of oils from algae, and I hate to break it to you, but the algae in your jacuzzi doesn't produce much oil. Darn, oh, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> um, and so this does require um, naturally, uh, naturally available algae, but ones that are a little bit more viable commercial strain. So we knew that this oil could be uh, produced by algae and converted to diesel, but we really wanted to think about how we could increase the production to make it cheaper because really the interest in this is to make it economically viable so we can try to think about alternative energy solutions. So we thought about this as a biological molecule and thought amongst some other molecules to see what it would do in the presence of our algae. And so currently, are there any operating facilities using this algae uh, theory, or it's beyond a theory, but uh, using algae as a oil producer right now here in California? So there's a few companies that have started to look at this, and a lot of the options not only consider oils for alternative fuels, but for nutraceuticals, food, and health applications. Um, So there's quite a few areas of interest, and I think the scale at which we have to pursue it for um, fuels is something that we're still ramping up towards. But it's definitely moving in that direction. So, yeah, that's what I was going to ask, Annalise, is um, how would it, do you, is there a notion yet how it would be harvested? Is it something that we could somehow get out of the ocean where algae is, you know, doing its thing? Or would it have to be done in some controlled environment somewhere? There's definitely still questions about that in the research, but one of the advantages of algae is that it can grow in salt water, so you can avoid having to use a lot of land that would be um, competitive against different food crops. Oh, mm-hmm. So we can take advantage of the photosynthesis, the fact that all we're using is sun and the carbon dioxide from the air to actually create this oil in, as you pointed out earlier, a very rapid time frame. Um, but we do need to think about how the engineering and the chemistry is going to come together to really make this a solution. And so the tea helps, does it speed up the algae or it speed up speeds up the oil production? So it tends to allow the growth to pursue at a good rate while also producing the oil within the algae um, because this molecule, we don't understand exactly how it's having its effect. Now we'd like to pursue that. But it seems to be kind of like a vitamin boost or a happy pill maybe <laughs> <laughs> in terms of keeping that algae growing at a good rate while not making it too skinny. We want to have it nice and fat with all that oil. Yeah. What's the quality of the oil? You know, you have different uh, levels of petroleum. You've got the tar sands that you really have to go through a lot of work to uh, make it something that we can eventually then put into our automobiles or whatever. Uh, and then you have like the, the sweet premium crude, you know, that comes out of uh, Saudi Arabia and places uh, like that. What's the, what's the quality of the oil produced by this algae? Well, the oils we're producing can be converted into biodiesel, and this is typically very high-quality biodiesel that would be considered on par with the sweet crude oil. So one of the advantages may be that we can use it to prolong some of the um, existing oil supplies that aren't quite as high-quality as we would want for some of our uh, transportation needs. 
So is one of the beneficial side effects of this whole algae process that it does take in the CO2? I mean, is that it's sort of cleaning the air while it's doing its thing? Yeah, so it's a carbon neutral process. It's actually going to allow you to use the carbon dioxide out of the air as opposed to um, releasing an old store um, from ancient oil production. However, it is carbon neutral so that when you burn it, it will kind of reproduce that oil in a, or carbon dioxide in a general cycle. That's better than what we've got going on right now. <laughs> so, it's definitely better than what we've got, yeah. I think that's uh, fantastic. One thing that uh, I noticed, and anyone watching our video simulcast right now at eatdrinkexplore.com will have seen some of the pictures that we're, we're sort of uh, going through here, is that it, is it an all-female team that worked on this? <laughs> It, well, we have I have a research team with three graduate students and one undergraduate student, and our undergraduate student is a male. Um, but we had Megan Danielowitz, Diana Wong, and Lisa Anderson, who were really excited about this research based on both the environmental and alternative fuel aspects, as well as some of the really cool scientific questions that we get to ask about these algae pathways. Is that a trend you're seeing at UC Davis, uh, many more women getting into the fields of science and maybe mathematics? We're doing our best to recruit a lot of women into science, mathematics, and engineering. And I think a lot of these real-world problems like energy are really good at attracting students. Good. But we see that across the board. There's a lot of excitement for both the guys and the girls. That's good to see. I like hearing that. I like hearing that as well. Now, this uh, compound that's in the tea, and you also said to some degree in chocolate, those seem like things that are also good for humans. <laughs> you know, like, uh, or is this a is this a chemical that we've found that works uh, nice with our bodies as well? Yeah, there's actually quite a few exciting studies, and it's not work that my lab is doing, but just in, in the literature and in other labs, looking at how there can be therapeutic and health effects for these types of catechin molecules. So it seems as if they they do have good effects on regulating and keeping our cellular processes functioning the way they're supposed to be. Catechin. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, catechin. So, you know, if you're going to drink some green tea, it doesn't hurt to have a little dark chocolate with it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> we I, like hearing that. <laughs> I like that. So uh, green tea would be far... Oh, what I should ask is, can you produce catechins without uh, growing green tea or making chocolate? Is that something you can make in a lab? We can, but the natural production of this is just quite effective. So we started with a purified source of this catechin molecule that was basically purchased from a, a, a company. But what we'd really like to do now is think about if you either take over the leftover tea that you have after you, you make your tea in the morning, can we use that by adding it directly to the algae so we can take advantage of that natural source that's not purified meaning we don't exactly know what's in there, but it can have the same effect on the algae pathways. Well, that's interesting because uh, companies like, uh, Pete, I know Pete's Coffee does this, where they take the coffee grounds. I was thinking the same uh -huh. thing. People are using coffee grounds for all kinds of things after they've been used. This is great if you found a use for the tea after yeah, it's the used. Tea, um, coffee grounds, we think that there might be options there because then it's going to be even more renewable if someone else has already used it and kind of discarded it. I it's, love the research. I know. What is not to love about all of this? I it's, it's amazing. How much oil do you know yet? So algae are obviously little tiny things. Um, <laughs> that's probably not scientifically what they are, but they're little tiny things. <laughs> How much oh oil God. do they make? <laughs> they make anywhere from 20 to 80% of their cell mass. Oh. So if you think about one little microorganism cell, it's producing anywhere from 20 to 80% of its cell mass as oil. And using and these, really, go ahead. Uh, we really want to take the ones that are only producing twenty to thirty percent and bring them up to that eighty percent mark. That's what I was going to say. The cate <laughs> yeah, the catechins are Give helping. Give them a boost. <laughs> uh, push it. Right. Anna Dr. Annalise Franz uh, with the UC Davis Bioenergy Research Center. Thank you for updating us and continued success with your work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Stick around.